Okay, so why am I here? Well, I don't like to call myself an expert, but I do uh, work at a national level advising government on flood risk. Um, I've been involved in lots of major infrastructure projects. Some of the infamous, um, I suppose, rail projects you might know about at the moment. I was involved in the flood risk and some of the major highway improvement schemes as well. Some of the faces I think I sort of recognise as well from working with this local authority when I've been involved in the floodmobile, which has been around various villages and the towns. I've been helping out with that and um, sort of been there to engage with you um, to explain what those kind of measures are and how as a community you can take action to help in your areas. And we'll touch a little bit more on that floodmobile and those kind of actions a little bit further on. Um, I work for a company called ACOM, which is a consultancy. We're primarily a civil engineering <coughs> firm, um, which incorporates flood risk as well, and of course, community resilience. So hence, we're here today. Okay, so I thought I'd briefly talk about the history of flooding and within the UK and, and why we have an LLFA and why we're so interested in flooding. I'm also going to talk about the introduction. So I, I know some people this is gonna be you already know all of this. I can certainly tell from the Alcombe Flood Group that you don't need this kind of information. But for others who are on the journey, I think it's important to kind of understand um, the different sources of flooding. And we'll touch on those and the kind of ways we like to mitigate those uh, within the industry. And we'll also touch at the end on some of those um, different measures that we had on the floodmobile. So around flood doors, flood barriers. Um, and those community level action plans that can really help, which is part of the reason why I believe you're here today. Okay, a brief history, and it is sort of brief. And I was slightly concerned in the last slides because uh, there was some history there of some of the flood events and thought you must have seen my slides before today. But anyway, yeah, slightly different. But 1947, and I'm going to give you some figures here, 300,000 hectares of land was flooded in 1947. Um, one of the biggest events that we have on record at the time. 1953, um, huge amount of flooding, mainly from the coast um, in these areas. Um, and this was the start really of building some substantial flood defences um, that we now use and we see, and we have the benefit of in the UK, particularly in the East Anglian region. We skip forward a bit. Um, to 1998 and uh, the autumn of the next year and it's really started to reinforce the idea that flooding is here to stay it's not something that's going to go away we have to learn to live with it and you'll see that as a bit of a focus of my slides that um, there isn't a 100% solution as was sort of mentioned before and it's about um, how we bring different different approaches together so in order so it has a less impact and we can live with it okay 2000. Now things start to get really serious when you get MPs involved and now you're really starting to get some uh, activity, you're seeing um, money being spent in the area and being committed. And when that starts to happen, um, we start to see the likes of the Environment Agency having these large uh, amounts of money um, being earmarked for, for schemes and to make a real difference in our area. Some of these things now are probably going to start coming back to your memory because you may remember them um, and you may have experienced some of them. 2007, 55,000 homes um, were flooded. Around 7,000 people were rescued from floodwaters and 13 people lost their lives. I think sometimes, um, particularly as someone who works in this industry, we can forget the impact that sometimes this can happen and people losing their lives um, is, is obviously very serious. And actually, um, it, we shouldn't become blasé around living with water. It's something we have got to manage. And there at the bottom, um, from Sir Michael Pitt, he was a chap who did a report um, on this on behalf of government. And, and this was the real start of um, needing to take forward actions um, and for the creation of lead local flood authorities around. And that's why the team you heard from this morning and have been organising this event are here. 2012, so it didn't quite stop there, another 7,000 houses were flooded. 2013 14, one of the wettest winters in over a few hundred years. Uh, one billion pounds worth of damages was estimated for the UK in that event alone. Uh, 600 houses uh, in the southwest and 6,900 hectares of agricultural land. 
2015. This might you remember these. These were villages now that are starting to be isolated. Bridges were destroyed during floods. So those that were kind of on islands, they, they become um, unconnected. And that's another part of flood resilience as a community. If you realise that you could become isolated because the roads are impassable, um, how, how are you going to build resilience to survive during the time whilst those um, bridges are repaired or the flood water, flood waters recede? 2018, um, more recent, I was involved for Milton Keynes Council. A thousand properties were affected by flooding then as an independent flood report um, that went it up into DEFRA around that particular event because of the scale of it. 2020, everyone remembers 2020 surely because that was flooding all over, particularly in this area and it was 14 locations um, here when that happened. 550 properties were affected by uh, by severe weather and about 80% of the monthly rainfall that was expected fell within that one event alone. So that tells you the kind of volume of water that needed to be um, managed. These things aren't going to go away. We're seeing the impacts from climate change. Rainfall is increasing um, and these things are only going to increase. So how we manage them is, is sort of bits I'm going to touch on today. In the local context, I don't know if anyone's ever been onto the website, but there's a website and there's a map on the website and that shows where all of the flood investigations that have been completed by the council, the section 19 investigations as was mentioned before by the LLFA. This is a map and you can click on any of these and it will bring up the report and you can see um, the investigation that was undertaken and the recommendations that have been made. If you, if you haven't seen that, it's useful to go and have a look. And on the right, I've just sort of pinpointed a few of the most recent ones and the Section 19s or the flood investigation reports, which are available. Uh, and again, like I say, those 14 locations from winter 2020 um, are on there as well. Okay, we'll move on. So, a bit of interaction to keep you all going this morning. What are the main sources of flood risk? Shout them out. There's not a wrong answer. There might be, but I'll tell you. Be brave. Rain, okay. Change of land use. Change of land use, yeah. I'm thinking about the sources of the water, perhaps. Sea water. Sea, yeah. In 1947, it was snow, lots of it. Lots of snow, yes. Okay. More? Groundwater. Groundwater, there's four. Two more? Put it out of your misery. They are the, the main six, as we would want to define them. <laughs> and I put those up there because I think as you're looking at... Um, how to manage the flood risk in your communities, understanding the sources. Sometimes it can be very easy to see, well, there's, there's water on the road, it's to do with the drains. It could be, but there could be many other underlying reasons as to what's got to that stage. It could, um, it could be that there is high water levels in the river, and which in turn means that the drains are unable to then discharge. There's, it's not always quite as straightforward as what we see. So. It's important, I would say, to understand the different sources, the ones that are relevant, and, um, and what that means for you. So where might we get some of this information? Because ultimately, some of you may already know this for your areas, but otherwise you might want to, after today, want to go away and learn more about the flood risk. So initially, the Environment Agency Online, um, they have some great mapping on there and we'll see some extracts that I've got in the slides today to show you what that looks like. That's really useful and we use that in industry ourselves. It's some of the best mapping that's available, particularly for the public. So that's a very good source. Um, and that covers um, the main sort of sources of flooding that you would be concerned about. Lead Local Flood Authority, they're here today and they're always available at the end of the phone um, and on emails. Again, like I mentioned before, I've worked with lots of authorities across the UK, and I'm not saying it just because I'm here, but this is one of the better ones that I've worked with in terms of their forward thinking, in terms of the kind of um, work streams they want to promote, the kind of funding that they're talking about. So the likes of the ordinary water course, sort of pot of money that's there, quite innovative really. I've not really seen many places that are also doing that. It's not unique, but quite innovative. Um, so really do make the most of that that you have got a really good team, quite an extensive team there who are, are at hand and know what they're doing. The flood investigation reports I mentioned, there, there is that website within the council's own website. Go on there, have a look. You'll find, you may find ones for your area. Flood risk assessments, which are done to support planning applications. Uh, they can be a very good source of information as well and bring it together into one location. 
hydraulic model data um, is there and reports are flooded. This is something which is, comes from, from you. you. You know your communities, you know where places flood. And it can be very easy sometimes to think that someone else has reported it. Always report the flooding to who you think is most relevant. For the LLFA, the Lead Local Flood Authority, would always be wanting to learn about it because that gives them the biggest picture and they can understand about it. And if it's not quite for them, they'll pass it on to the people who they work with. But if they don't know, um, they can't do something about it. So don't always assume someone else has because um, these are great sources. Others, water companies um, are available. They, they have information around where their networks um, are under capacity, over capacity, we'd like to hope. <laughs> uh, the Met Office, in terms of um, their alerts for high rainfall, uh, we're seeing, starting to see the other sort of weather alerts as well, but rainfall particularly is useful. Now, I don't know if anyone recognises the chap on the right-hand side, but there was quite an infamous uh, report. Uh, I'd like to think that it's come a long way since then, and I, I generally think that the alerts and stuff we do receive now is a, is a good step forward, and it means that we're all kind of available, uh, we're all aware of what may be happening. Community groups, yourselves, you know, you're going to be the central hubs for your communities who are going to be the ones who are clued up to share that information with neighbours and others so they can also understand and come on the journey. That's what it's about. Media, uh, generally it's okay, generally, but you've got to take some of it with a pinch of salt. There's a lot of uh, wanting to get the clickbait when you're online or wanting to be able to sell a newspaper. So you've got to be careful, but it is useful and we do use it um, in, in industry to understand where flooding has happened and to get the anecdotal evidence as well as what happened, how far, how deep, for example, is the flood water. I'm going to uh, carry on. So there was talk before around risk and understanding it, and you may have heard some terms. So risk is the likelihood multiplied by what the impact would be. Okay. Now, sometimes if you talked about in return periods, one in X number of years, and that can be a bit confusing, I think, for people, because it could be, you've, as anyone heard of one in a hundred year storm or one in a hundred year flood event, that doesn't mean that it's going to happen once in every 100 years. That's, it's just a way of representing likelihood or the risk associated with it. Another better way sometimes to think about it is a, an AEP, which is a percentage, 1%. So one in 100 is the same as having a 1% chance. And the key to all of this is it can happen in every year. Okay, so think about a dice. If you've got a dice and you were to roll that, the chance of you rolling a six are going to be one in six. If you roll, a, so that, that's happened, you've rolled a six. If you roll, roll that dice again now, you've still got a one in six chance of it happening again. And that's exactly the same as what return periods are and AEPs are. It's not that it's going to happen once every 100 years. It's just a way of representing how likely it is. Okay, so try and remember that dice, if nothing else, that it could happen back to back. Right, here's some extracts that I've got from that Environment Agency online mapping, which I thought would just be useful and for some of the um, areas that you may be in, and just to try and represent some of the differences and explain what they mean. I apologise for those who think that this is a little bit high level and you already know some of this, but for, tho for those who aren't, it could be useful. So this is the flood map for rivers and sea, and it represents, you know, these blue outlines, as you can imagine, are where, from the model data, we would predict during certain storm events um, or flood events, we would expect the water to go. And then see on the right-hand side with that legend, that's um, how likely or not it is to happen. Okay. So I would hope, is anyone here from March? Well, your office is, yeah. So you may, may be able to represent some of this and understand it. But just as we go through these, the high means 3.3%. Uh, so that is one in 30 years, the equivalent, okay? The medium is between that 30 year and 100 year, so 3.3 to one. Low is one to 0.1%, and when you go to very low, it's over 0.1, um, just to try and give you that context of what it means. So if we go for March again, the same map, but now we're looking at the surface water map, and this is very different, isn't it, between the two. You can sort of see very clear outlines of where you might expect for the rivers and sea, but for surface water, these are very good because they're looking at how the, how the land is, where the low spots are. So you can sort of see in these locations, perhaps 
where there's low, low spots, that's where the water lies. And that's how the mapping is produced. They take the levels of the land, they throw water on the top of it and they see where it ends up. And what it is also useful to do, it can pick up water courses as well that perhaps aren't, haven't been mapped, but because they're low spots generally, that can be quite useful if you're not sure where those are. And this is the flood map for reservoirs. So for March, um, there isn't really an awful lot to be worried about there. We'll go on now to Broughton. Anyone here from Broughton? Ah, have you seen these maps before? Ah, good, okay. So not new then, we're not having any sort of people falling over thinking, crikey, my house is at flood and I'm at risk <laughs> and I never knew. But again, we can see here with the river coming through and the extents that would be associated with it. And the surface water, as you would imagine actually in this location, is following generally uh, the line of, of where the water course is as it wants to make its way towards it. Uh, this is useful also for uh, identifying flow paths. So you can see here where those are. This is the reservoir map. So this would be if a reservoir were to fail, then the blue outline is where you would imagine it would go. And the red hatched outline is if that were to occur at the same time as if the river levels were high as well. So it's kind of like joint likelihood of it happening. Uh, Witten and Houghton, anyone from here? Ah, okay. Seen this map before as well? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, quite extensive blue here, and this is the kind of uh, impacts that we would expect to see during those events related to that on the right. The surface water looks very different, and this is why it's important when the, those six different sources I talked around, to, we need to understand, and you need to understand what those different sources would do in your area because defending or looking to mitigate against one, say this one, the mitigation for that may look very different to mitigating against localised surface water flooding in those locations. So it's, again, it's about bringing different things together to manage risk holistically. And that's a reservoir map. Uh, so it would be fairly <laughs> impactful in that location if the reservoir were to fail there. Right, so how do we live with risk? I mentioned that that's something which we have to do. We can't resolve it. We've built in these places over hundreds of years. This is where we all live and work. So how do we live with it? And it's a combination of things, really. Um, it's a bit of a jigsaw. And this is the process that we try to go through um, to do it. So we try and avoid the risk in the first instance. Don't build in these places, which we now know are at risk. We've got much better information around where those are, those maps I've just shown you, to try and avoid it in the first, in the first place control it where we can. So the LLFA, they have controlling um, measures if they would like to use them under certain regulations for alterations to water courses, for example. The planning authority have control measures in terms of where new development is going to be placed. Mitigation, that's some of the things we can talk about in the next few slides around hard engineering solutions. We heard of some of those earlier for Alconbury. Um, but it could also be some of the softer side of things like actually at a community level or at a house level, which is on the banner you've seen on the pulled up on the left hand side. This is around those resistance and resilience measures we presented as part of the floodmobile that came around. And managing it, we have to appreciate that we, we're going to live with it and that we can't just hard engineer um, everything. So can't hard engineer everything. Um, so managing it through community groups, community action plans, being aware of it, minimising the impacts, that's how we would manage. So those are the kind of four things that we try to look at as ways to, to live with the risk. So what do you see here? You can shout out the obvious ones if you like. Someone being rescued. Someone being rescued, yes, definitely. Quite an old photo now. Any? Is that an ambulance station being cut off? Oh, no lie. And yes, Ambulance HQ. This building here is the ambulance headquarters, okay? This is an example where historically we've got it wrong. We've not avoided the risk. Perhaps we didn't know at the time, but now we do. Avoided the risk. The challenge is actually next door to here is also the fire HQ. So now we're in real trouble. We can't get ambulances out and we can't get the fire and rescue service out, which is really key for flooding. And just round the corner, believe it or not, is the local authority sandbag store, which <laughs> really does, you know, just puts it into perspective that this community isn't going to be very resilient in this case. Ways we can get it right is, here's an example of a new development, not all that far away, you may recognise it, where we're living in an area which is still 
around water. We're making space for water in our environments, but in the right way. We're creating ways that people can still live and work in these places. So it can be done right through the planning system. And I think there was a question before around, are we objecting to planning? Are we, um, are we sort of restricting planning? It's a lot better now with the LLFA in place, Environment Agency doing their work as well. And there's a lot more control over where new development is and it's mitigated correctly. I thought I'd give a few examples of large engineering measures um, that you can see on here. These are part of the suite of things that we can do. Um, you've got weirs in terms of flow control, and we've got embankments, we've got structures to retain the, um, the flow as well. Some of the softer stuff, natural flood management was mentioned before, so it might be useful for those who are not quite sure what those are to see some examples. So these kind of woody debris screens or leaky dams were mentioned, kind of a, a close and you can see them where they work together in terms of being able to manage flow. And here, sort of a, like a rewilding type scheme really. So rather than having a very linear straight water course, this has multiple benefits in terms of slowing the flow, but also having the biodiversity benefit and, I mean, and some amenity for people to come and enjoy that space. Those measures we're talking about, so I was talking to you about flood doors, um, flood barriers that are on the floodmobile. They are important because we can't always do those hard engineering measures. It's not always economically right. We can't always tick the boxes that we mentioned before for the funding. The, these are the alternatives. But some of those examples are what they can look like. So flood barriers here that come across the doors and how they can be finished in, in different colours to match so they become less impactful on buildings. Uh, and these are all removable, so that's kind of like a permanent part that's in there. This is totally removable and is stored and only deployed at a time when is needed, when you get that warning. Uh, this is from a recent scheme I've just been hoping to deliver down in Buckinghamshire. It's uh, so even quite bespoke where we've got these sort of... Um, kind of like a greenhouse type sort of conservatory thing on the side. We can protect those as well. Flood doors, I think there's sometimes a bit of a myth that you're going to really advertise that your, your house is at risk of flooding because you've got a flood door in. Well, I'm not sure about you, but these look very similar to the kind of doors that you would usually expect. And only a kind of expert eye would know the kind of things to look out for to spot it. But these are flood doors. That as soon as that's um, locked and you pull the handle up, it will protect water up to about 600 mil high you know, by design. And these are automatic air brick covers. Anyone who's been on the floodmobile, you would have seen these. And there's another one coming shortly um, in one of the neighbouring villages. They are, uh, you can see those then as well. Do take the time to go and have a look. It's definitely worth it. It's had really good um, response so far. Automatic air brick covers. So they, when uh, they've got a little flotation device in, so when the water starts to rise, the ball, the flotation part comes up, shuts off the gap, so water can't come in. And then when the water recedes, it opens again and the uh, house is able to breathe. So it's, it's an automated solution that once it's in, and they're not particularly expensive really to have that level of protection. That community level resilience we're talking about, and uh, there's a quite a useful website, if you don't already know about it, on the right hand side, which gives um, these kind of steps and this kind of help as to what you may want to go on uh, and this, uh, that you would need to do to um, get community level resilience as a flood group. And I would certainly recommend amongst the support you've got from the flood group here today and from the council, do visit this because you can, you're able to click on all of these and it has a drop down of lots of information. Um, and you can see some of the things there about the flood store, rain gauge warning systems, Again, here about flood resistance and resilience products um, and how, how to get funding. So all sorts of useful information. And the very final things is um, flood resilience for really for businesses. We can often forget about businesses. We get focused on residential properties around getting the protection, but small businesses really do struggle with flooding. Um, some of the figures on there, 40% you know, of businesses fail to reopen after a flood. That's significant. And for communities which depend on often small independent businesses, the corner shops, the local pharmacies, bakeries, things like that, if those flood, that part, that part of your hub in your community disappears. I did some work um, on behalf of DEFRA last year and the year before. And we created a handbook about this. So if you've got small businesses in your area which you feel may benefit, there's a free copy of this outside. Do take one. There's lots of useful information in there. 
um, and, and incorporate them into your plan. Don't get completely focused on residential. Think about the commercial and businesses as well. But perhaps that's the answer. Maybe that's how we can really solve it all and we wouldn't have to live with it.